Welcome to the beautiful CNN Center located in the bustling city of Atlanta, Georgia. This impressive structure is considered CNN's world headquarters and includes several state-of-the-art studios, newsrooms, offices, and an Omni Hotel. It's also a popular tourist destination, being the only place in the world where you can find both an Arby's and a Cartoon Network store, not to mention all of this exclusive CNN merch. The CNN Center is also home to the world's largest freestanding escalator, which is approximately 193 feet long and 8 stories high. Every day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., this escalator leads tour groups into a giant globe high above the food court. But that hasn't always been the case. Back in 1976, CNN didn't exist yet, and this escalator didn't just drop you off in front of a bunch of newsrooms. No, this massive escalator would transport you into a very different world. The world of Sid and Marty Croft. Back in the early 70s, Atlanta was going through somewhat of a slump. The term urban decay had become frequently used when talking about the city, and the crime rate was steadily increasing. Needless to say, people were steering clear of downtown. Luckily, Maurice Alpert of Alpert Investment Corporation and Tom Cousins of Cousins Properties had just the thing to revitalize the area. They started a joint venture called International City Corporation and proposed their flagship project, Omni International. It would be a $65 million, 14-story, multi-purpose megastructure located next to the Omni Coliseum, which was already being used for concerts and sporting events. Maurice Alpert described it as a city within a city, which was a pretty accurate description. Inside the Omni, they planned to have movie theaters, restaurants, high-end stores, 500 hotel rooms, 600,000 square feet of office space, and a regulation-size ice skating rink. As if that weren't enough, when plans for a trade pavilion fell through, they decided to designate that area of the Omni to some sort of family entertainment. But who could they possibly call on for a project like that? Enter Sid and Marty Croft. These two brothers had sort of become the guys to call for things like this. Whether it was designing the characters and sets for the Hanna-Barbera series The Banana Splits, or creating a cast of colorful characters for the Coca-Cola Pavilion at the 1968 World's Fair. One of those characters went on to become H.R. Puffinstuff, the star of the Croft Brothers' first massively successful children's TV series. From there, the Crofts created an empire, and with it, a slew of trippy TV shows, including Sigmund and the Sea Monsters, The Bugaloos, Lidsville, Land of the Lost, and even the Donnie and Marie Osmond variety show. The Croft Brothers also had experience in the theme park industry. Their fingerprints were all over Six Flags in the 70s. They had their own puppet theaters at several of the parks, and licensed some of their characters to Six Flags as well. They also designed rides, including the popular dark ride Tales of the Okefenokee at Six Flags Over Georgia, which would ironically become their biggest competition. A deal was made and several major lenders helped finance the $14 million project, which actually ended up costing closer to $24 million. This was expected to be the first of many locations for the world of Sid and Marty Croft. We've been offered other cities, but we're waiting to see how this one turns out, said Sid Croft. If it doesn't work in Atlanta, it can't work anywhere in the country, said Marty. Newspapers around the country were already covering the park a year in advance, and as the two-year project was nearing completion, the brothers and their company really ramped up the marketing. There was an hour-long special all about the park that was televised nationally, and J. Alton Alsup, the president of Croft International, boasted that their attendance projections for the first year would exceed one million visitors. No one could really blame them for being optimistic, though. The Croft Brothers were a proven brand, and the park was introducing some ideas that were pretty revolutionary at the time. As they said themselves, all the fun was indoors, which meant they were able to operate year-round. This led to them implementing an advanced ticket reservation system, much like a Broadway show, which would allow people to reserve tickets days, months, or theoretically, years in advance. This was also done out of necessity due to the park's 6,000 guest capacity. Also made sure to emphasize that the park would only take three to five hours to get through, which would quote, leave plenty of time for shopping, dining, sporting events, or taking in other activities. By the time the park opened its doors on May 26, 1976, excitement was at an all-time high. The opening of the park was an invite-only black tie affair with a guest list featuring the likes of Ernest Borgnine, Bob Denver, and even future president Jimmy Carter. Mayor Maynard Jackson called it the greatest opening in Atlanta since the opening of Gone with the Wind. 
Once the park had officially opened to the public, guests had a lot to look forward to. After receiving a ticket that would be used as a punch card as you travel through the park's various lands, you'd step off the world's longest escalator and be greeted by two massive harlequin statues and a real-life mime who was instructed to bother you until more guests arrived. This area was called Fantasy Fair, and it featured a variety of sideshows and spontaneous performances. I won't tell you how this is done, but I'll give you a clue. Only believe half of what you see. Just below that was Tranquility Terrace. You could see even more vaudeville acts here, but the main attraction was the Crystal Carousel, the first new merry-go-round designed in the U.S. within the previous 50 years. It featured hand-sculpted mythological creatures cast in translucent plastic and used aerospace technology to make guests feel like they were floating on a cushion of air. In fact, the Croft's lead engineer actually worked on the Apollo project. From there, you'd travel to Uptown and hop inside the giant pinball ride, where a gigantic robot would pull back the plunger and send you hurtling through a series of light-up tunnels, leading you all the way to the next section of the park, Lidsville. Based on the Croft show of the same name, this area was full of hat-shaped characters and hat-shaped buildings where you could buy all sorts of merchandise. This level also included the Lidsville Theater, where guests could see a show called Celebration, which featured a cast of costume characters, as well as marionettes resembling everyone from Elton John to Stevie Wonder. Guests would then board a mineshaft elevator and head down to the final level, Living Island Adventure, the home of H.R. Puffin Stuff. This ride would send you traveling through a forest of singing animatronic trees as you helped H.R. Puffin Stuff save the day from the evil witchy poo. And, just like that, your day at the world of Sid and Marty Croft would come to an end. With so many magical attractions, you'd think this park would have been an instant success. But unfortunately, they were also faced with a myriad of problems. It turns out most people don't want to work in an office or stay in a hotel room that's under the same roof as a noisy theme park. After many complaints, Omni International sent engineers to hang 350 sound-absorbing boxes from the ceiling to soak up the noise from the park. This cost the investors an additional half a million dollars, and that wasn't the only problem. The executive vice president of Omni International, Sal DePace, said this, The mechanical rides just caused us fits. Every time you turned around, they were breaking down. When you had a large crowd and the rides would break down, it was disastrous for us. The Living Adventure ride broke down two weekends in a row during the summer, which ironically forced the indoor theme park to hand out rain checks to disappointed visitors. Sid Croft blamed the investors, saying, The banks made us open before we were ready. After about three months, the park was awesome. Near the end, it was incredible, but it was too late. They tried everything to get more guests in the door, whether it was trotting out Witchy Poo and her friends at a Harlem Globetrotters game, or essentially turning the intro for the Croft Super Show into a commercial for the park. Nothing seemed to work. They had expected 3,500 to 4,000 guests per day, but they were lucky if they got a little more than 2,000 people on a busy Saturday. The downtown Atlanta area was still considered too dangerous by a lot of people, and no amount of circus performers or mythical creatures could convince them otherwise. Sid Croft said, the park was in a very rough part of town. The mayor had promised to clean up the area, but it didn't happen. People were scared. People also weren't happy that the park was not an all-day affair. Tickets were $5.75 for adults and $4.25 for children for only a few hours of entertainment, while Six Flags Over Georgia had enough fun to last an entire day. So just like that, only five and a half months after their dazzling, star-studded premiere, the world of Sid and Marty Croft closed its doors on November 7, 1976, having only brought in 300,000 guests in that time. After the park's closing, Marty Croft told the Atlanta Journal, We didn't have the opportunity to prove the thing out. We will never know whether it would have succeeded. The park sat there, dark and empty, high above Omni International for years. The joyous laughter and vibrant music now replaced with silence. There were talks of reopening the park in a different format, but nothing came to fruition. Photographer Jerry Burns was able to enter the abandoned park in 1980, four years after its closing. The Sid and Marty Croft area was sort of a ghost town. It literally had big sheets draped over things. I was talking to our guide there and I said, what are they going to do with this stuff? He said they were going to throw it away in the dumpster. This meant bad news for the rest of Omni International as well. The sprawling complex sat mostly empty. The comptroller for one of the restaurants inside Omni International had this to say, 
You'd be amazed at the number of hotel guests who jump into cabs and go uptown to dinner, not even aware of all the Omni's other attractions. And if you're going to lease an office, who wants to look out over an amusement park that's standing empty? This would hold true until CNN moved their headquarters to the Omni complex in 1987, officially rebranding it as the CNN Center. Sid and Marty Croft, now 90 and 82 years old respectively, are still working in children's entertainment today. They brought Land of the Lost to the big screen in 2009, created a brand new show for Nick Jr. in 2015, and most recently rebooted two of their old beloved series for a new generation to enjoy. As a daily CNN viewer, Marty Croft is always reminded of the park that never quite reached its full potential. When you close a project, usually it fades away. I now watch my park every day on TV. This thing never dies for me. But this was one of the eight wonders of the world. If it would have worked, there'd probably be 20 of them around the country. But we gave it a great shot. We did give it a good shot. Hey guys, thanks for watching this episode of New Nostalgia. If you'd like to hear us talk more about the world of Sid and Marty Croft and share a whole bunch more info that we couldn't include here, you can listen to our podcast in the description below. I'd also like to thank the I Went to the World of Sid and Marty Croft in Atlanta, Georgia Facebook page. This video wouldn't have been possible without them as a resource. You can also check us out on all our social media. That's in the description below as well. And we'll see you next time.